All right. I don't know what happened. I <laughs> had it set up, and when I clicked the camera part, it said there is no camera on this computer. I said, okay, this is a computer I've been using for several weeks. <laughs> okay, I think I accidentally might have knocked a few of you off there. I don't know. Mm. Now this is going to be. Uh, this is the whole white thing. Nah. Let's see. I'm wearing a dark shirt. There's always issues. The autofocus, yeah. You know what? I'm going to go change my shirt real fast. I'll put on a light shirt. I know this was one of the problems we had before is that everything gets kind of blinding, doesn't it? Always wanted to play fashion Barbie with my team. So the continuation of grabbing concepts, we're going to look at a major, major thing today. And it's, going to, it's called the first derivative test. That's our big goal today. That's not the only topic, but that's sort of the biggest one. And it's essentially, if I have a function and I take derivatives and I do all of the analysis of the function, how do I actually know when I've got a maximum or a minimum? How do I know when the function is going uphill versus going downhill without the benefit of a picture? Well, think of it this way. At no time do you ever have to have the picture to, to do any form of the analysis. All the analysis will take place without a picture. Ah, the picture is sort of after the fact to confirm all the stuff we did. You say, but I got a graphing calculator. This has been around for 400 years. Graphing calculators haven't. And we've always been able to do the analysis without the picture. That's the beautiful thing. The graphing calculator just speeds up some of the parts. So before we start on the calculus part, I'm going to review some algebra, some really obscure algebra that you all learned probably in you know, algebra two in high school. And it's the sort of thing I need to be able to know really, really well in order to do the calculus, but it's stuff that most people don't remember very well. And it has to do with solving inequalities when you have multiple variables. So if I said, for example, I want to solve x squared is, let's say, greater than or equal to 9. Well, if I wanted to solve this inequality, it's like, how do I, so is x greater than or equal to 3? I mean, is that what I would do? No. Whenever you're solving um, an inequality, you first have to get a 0 on one side. So the first thing you do is you do this. Oops. I'm sorry, I said greater than or equal to 3. Now, factor this. Okay, so now does that mean that x plus 3 is greater than 0 or x minus 3 is greater than 0? Nope. <laughs> nope. All of the rules of equals go out the window when it's an inequality. So what we need to do is say, okay, this product is either positive, it's negative, or it's 0. Those are my only three possibilities. So what I'm going to do is make a number line and then analyze my results using the number line. Now, where does the product equal 0? it's going to equal zero at negative three and positive three. So what I have just done is I have partitioned the number line into three intervals. Interval from negative infinity to negative three, from negative three to positive three, and from positive three to infinity. The three completely separate, unrelated, non-overlapping intervals. So what I want to do is figure out in each interval, is this product positive or is it negative? I don't have to worry about the zero because those are the only two places where it's zero. <clears throat> so, at this point, I'm actually going to ignore the inequality, because if I had put a greater than, a greater than or equal, a less than, a less than or equal, my analysis is going to be the same. It's just which intervals do I choose for my answer <clears throat> will be determined by that. So, if I take a number in this interval, and here's the beautiful thing about solving inequalities. If I take a number in this interval from negative infinity to negative three, and it makes this quantity positive, then every number in that interval makes it positive. If I take a number in that interval and it makes the product negative, then every number in the interval makes it negative. How come? Because first of all, this is continuous and you can't go from positive to negative or negative to positive without passing through zero. And since these are the only two places that equal zero, everything else in the interval is all or nothing. So let's pick a number to the left of negative three, like how about negative bazillion? I always like being safe. Negative bazillion plus three is negative. Negative bazillion minus three is negative. 
and the product of two negative numbers is positive. So the way I like to do this visually is I'm going to shade everything above the line. Okay, that's simple. Now you say, wait, why didn't I pick specific values and, and determine their values? Because I'm not interested in the value. I'm only interested in the sign. And if every number in this interval is going to produce the same sign, the numerical value is irrelevant. It's only the sign. Now you could put a specific number. We, we can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I could have said negative 13. You know, what do I get? Now let's pick a number in this interval. Number bigger than three, like positive bazillion. Positive bazillion plus three is positive. Bazillion is really big, by the way. Positive bazillion minus three is also positive, and this is positive. Okay, great. Now let's pick a number between negative three and three. So now I really do need to pick a number. So how about zero? Zero plus three, yes, that's three, but that's not important, it's positive. Zero minus three is negative, and the product of a positive and a negative is here. So I have partitioned the number line into three separate intervals. The question I had is, which intervals make this greater than or equal to zero? Well, clearly it would be these two. But what if the question had been less than zero? Then I would pick this one. So the way I did the problem is the same regardless of the direction. So my final answer now is, I want these two intervals. So my answer would be negative infinity, oops, not negative eight, negative infinity to negative three, closed because that's a closed interval, union, three to infinity. Had the answer been in the other direction, I would have picked that interval. So this is pretty simple stuff. Everybody hopefully remembers how to do things of this nature, okay? So the factoring is actually really huge. So let's do another one similar to this. Let's say I wanted to solve, and let's say it's already factored. I've got um, x, uh, plus four quantity squared times x minus seven, and I want that to be strictly less than zero. Okay. Well, I start the same way. I make a number line, and the only thing I'm interested in is where on my number line it's positive, negative, or zero. So on my number line, I'm going to be zero at negative four and positive seven. So I've got three intervals, and we'll pick a value in each interval. So pick a value to the left of negative four, like negative bazillion. So negative bazillion, when I add it to four, is still negative. But now I'm going to square it, so that's going to be positive. Negative bazillion minus seven, that's definitely negative. And that product clearly is therefore down here. All right, now let's pick a number between negative four and positive seven. Well, how about zero? That seems like a no-brainer. Zero plus four, that's positive. I'm squaring it, still positive. Zero minus seven, that's also negative. Oh. Okay. And now let's pick a number bigger than seven, like how about bazillion? Okay. Bazillion plus four squared, positive. Bazillion minus seven, positive, and I'm up here. Great. Now, the question was, when is it less than zero? So now the question is, do I take negative infinity to seven? Anybody want to chime in? Is that the right answer, yes or no? No, because four and seven aren't included. Beautiful. This is a strict inequality. The product equals zero at negative four, so negative four cannot be included in the answer. This, this one seems to trouble people, but this is actually the norm. Um, normally when we're going to solve these types of inequalities, they're always going to be strict inequalities. So there won't be endpoints in general. So this is actually going to be negative infinity to negative four union negative four to seven. And this is the answer right here. If I include negative four, then I've said zero is a negative number, which doesn't make any sense. That, that's not, that's not good. So this is how you do it. So, oh, okay. That's, that's a piece of cake. Not a big deal at all. Now let's do one more example of this. Um, and hopefully you guys remember a little bit of this, and, and I don't need you to remember how you did it in algebra, because I'm showing you this is how I want you to do it right now. What if we have something, I'll keep it really simple, I've got uh, x plus 3 over x minus 5, and I want that to be, let's say, greater than 0. Hmm. Well, first thing is, can I multiply both sides by x minus 5? No, I can't. Sorry, can't do that. Why? 
because isn't x minus five negative half the time? <laughs> oh, and when you multiply both sides of an inequality by a negative, the inequality changes direction. Yeah, you, you can't multiply both sides by negative five, that, or x minus five, that, that will mess everything up. So what do I do? Well, remember the rules for products of negatives is the same as the rules for, for quotients. If I have a product with an even number of negatives, it's positive. If I have a product with an odd number of negatives, it's negative. If I have a quotient with an even number of negatives, it's positive. If I have a quotient with an odd number of negatives, it's negative. It's the same rule. Oh, that's because the reciprocal of a negative is still negative. The reciprocal of a positive is still positive. So where does numerator and denominator both equal zero? Numerator zero at negative three, denominator zero at five, but the denominator can't be zero. You're right. But the denominator is going to change sign at five. On one side of five, the denominator is positive. On the other side of five, the denominator is negative. So I have to use five to determine one side or the other. Aha. So this problem, I'm going to do almost exactly the same way as if this was a product. So pick a number left of negative three, like negative bazillion, and I'll be negative over negative. Meaning every number less than negative three will make this quotient positive. Okay? Pick a number between negative three and five, like zero. I'd be positive over negative. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. <laughs> zero, I'd be positive over negative. There we go. And I'd be down here. Now pick a number bigger than five, like bazillion. I'd be positive over positive. Boom. And so my final answer is going to simply be negative infinity to negative three union five to infinity. The union just means I'm joining them. There is no overlap. So anything in this interval or anything in this interval is the correct. So that's that's it. That's the algebra review that, that we need to be able to answer our stuff for today. Now, this is not complicated, but this is probably not something you've done recently. So if I'm going to analyze a graph now, okay, let's go back to the picture we drew the other day. I want to, you know, just, I've got a graph and it's doing stuff. And we know to find that guy right there, let's call that A, and that guy right there, let's call that B. To find those, I need to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So in my picture, F prime of A equals F prime of B equals zero. That's where I'm going to have a horizontal tangent. But what's happening in the rest of the curve? Well, I know in this region, in this part of the curve right here, f prime of x is positive. How do I know that? Because the curve's going uphill. I know in this part right here, f prime of x is negative because the curve's going downhill. And then over here, f prime of x is positive. So when we find our derivative and we set it equal to zero and we find where those critical values are, in this case, it'd be a and b, what about the rest of the graph? Ah, where the derivative is positive, we say that f is increasing. That's the words we use. Where the derivative is negative, f is decreasing. Where the derivative is positive, again, f is increasing. And those are things we're going to identify. And the beautiful thing about it is I can now identify maximums and minimums by where it changes direction. See, if I, without a picture, if I identify that it's in, that the graph is increasing from here to here, it's flat, and then it's decreasing, then I know there's a maximum at this point. Same thing here. If I identify it as decreasing, it's flat, and then it's increasing, I identify there's going to be a minimum value there. And I don't need a picture. I just need inequalities. Okay? So let's do some very specific problems. I've got a few laid out for you. Carefully chosen. I went to the, the function store and you know, got my shopping cart out and I picked out some functions that I think you would all really enjoy. All right. So let's see. You got it. F of x equals x cubed minus 3x squared uh, minus 9x plus 5. This is a cubic. Now, we love cubics because cubics are not hard to work with. But cubics tend to change direction a few times. That's kind of a, a neat little thing. Um, first thing, like I said last day, what is the domain? The domain of this, because it's a polynomial, is all real numbers. And that is critical. Okay, That means I have absolutely no restrictions. 
So when I'm doing intervals, I get to use the whole number line. That's a good thing. I like that. So our first goal, let's find where the derivative is zero. So f prime of x is 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. If I factor out the 3, I'll get x squared minus 2x minus 3. And I can easily factor that as x. That's like the x plus 1x minus 3. Dude. Okay. So hopefully everybody has this. And this equals 0 at x equals negative 1 or x equals 3. Great. Now here's what I want to do. I want to determine not only, I've, I've determined where the horizontal tangents are. I want to determine where's the graph going uphill. Where's the graph going downhill? Where's my maximum? Where's my minimum? I want to determine that, and I'm not even going to bother drawing the picture. We'll do that later. Right? That's, that's boring, drawing the picture. That just means I'm going to make a table of values and then plot points. <sighs> right? That's not exciting. You can do that with a graphing calculator. I want to tell you everything there is to know about the graph without drawing a picture. So let's make a number line. And it's going to be the F prime number line. The only two values on my number line. Now, here's what I'd like to know. I'd like to know exactly where is the derivative positive and exactly where is the derivative negative. Because this is the derivative. Where is that positive? Where is that negative? Hmm, how are we going to do that? Well, that's what we just reviewed. So I've got three intervals. If I pick a number to the left of negative one, like negative bazillion, that's going to be negative. That's going to be negative, and that product will be positive. If I pick a number between negative 1 and positive 3, how about 0? I have to pick a number in that interval. 0 plus 1 is positive. 0 minus 3 is negative. Now I'll pick a number bigger than 3, like bazillion. Then I'd have positive, positive, and positive. Now, I teach this the same way every semester. There is nothing possibly that you could do is, that is easier than what I just did in terms of determining intervals. Now, having said that, since in, this is a, rig, a normal calculus class, <laughs> there's not more than one or two of you that haven't had calculus at least once or twice, high school, college, and everybody has their own way of doing things. And I'm finding when people do their own way is almost always incorrect, meaning they're never going to get this because what they end up doing is just guessing. The moment I see numerical values in determining the intervals, then you've missed the point. You can't use a numerical value to determine increasing and decreasing. You can only use the sign. So when we start doing calculations, we're, we're, we're going in completely the wrong direction. There is no calculation. I did this without calculating. I just said, what's the sign? Now I can say, absolutely. The derivative is positive in these two intervals. The derivative is negative in these two in, in this interval. So we say that f is increasing in these two intervals. f prime is positive. That means f is increasing negative infinity, negative 1, and then again from 3 to infinity. f is decreasing. from negative one to three. Now, one thing I want to point out, all of these intervals have to be open intervals. There are textbooks like Swakowski. That's one of the things that used to make me in pain. Every inequality in that book, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of inequalities listed in the book and the solutions in the book. Every single inequality in the book is incorrect. <laughs> Hard to imagine that somebody didn't catch that. In, Swak in the Swakowski text, which was a very popular text, it makes all of them closed intervals. Well, there's a problem with that because, see, this says that f prime of x is negative everywhere in this interval. But if I make that closed at negative 1 and I make that closed at negative 1, then I'm saying the derivative equals 0 at negative 1, the derivative is positive at negative 1, and the derivative is negative at negative 1. What? That's equivalent to saying 0 is both positive and negative at the same time. Actually, 0 is neither positive nor negative. That's why you can't have closed intervals because you'd be saying the number zero, right, which is what the derivative equaled is in all intervals. No, no, no. So always open intervals here. 
Now, what does that mean for my graph? That means my graph is going uphill in this interval, gets flat, then it's going downhill, then it's going uphill again. So if I don't know anything else, I know that's going to be the shape of my graph. I, I have to plot a few points to figure out where on the xy plane it is, but I now know that's the shape. Well, didn't I know that already because it was a cubic? No, a cubic has three shapes. That's only one of them. Y equal x cubed looks like this, <laughs> or it can flatten out. Yeah, cubics don't have to turn around. This one just happens to. Yeah, y equal x cubed, we know what that looks like. That doesn't turn around. So now the last thing, and probably the most important part, I'd like to know where's there a maximum, where's there a minimum? What does this tell me? The graph is going up and it's flat. How do I know it's flat? Because I have horizontal tangent here and here, and then the graph is going down. Graph going up, it's coming down. That means f of negative one. And let's calculate what's f of negative one. That'd be negative one minus three is negative four plus nine plus five. I think that would be 10. 14, 11. Yep. Yeah. f of negative one equals 10 is a, I'm going to put blank maximum. Now, what do I mean by blank? Well, is it a local maximum or is it an absolute maximum? Is it relative or is it the highest point in the whole graph? Well, we'll come back to that part. That's actually very, very simple. That doesn't require calculus. Now, what's happening here? Going down. I was flat and I'm coming back up. So clearly I'm going to have a minimum. So f of three, which is three cubed minus three cubed. And then we'd have negative 27 plus five. So that'd be negative 22 is a blank minimum. I've now identified my maximum and my minimum. And I still don't have a graph. Now, what I just did, what I just did by saying increasing, flat, decreasing, it's a max. That is called the first derivative test. I'm using the first derivative to determine that I had a maximum there. And similarly, this says I went down, flat, went up. I have a minimum there. That's the first derivative test. Now, the max is 10. The max isn't negative 1. Negative 1 is a critical value. Negative 1 is the x coordinate. 10 is the maximum. Negative 22 is the minimum. And I, I will say this now, and by the way, I would be saying this till the end of Calc 3 because some of them still don't get it. An extrema, a maximum or a minimum, is a y value, not an x value. Right? Think of a graph. The highest you are is a y coordinate, not an x coordinate. The x coordinate tells me where it happened, but that's the highest. That's the lowest. But is it the highest forever? Is it the lowest forever? So let's go back and look at this. This is x cubed. As x grows without bound, doesn't that mean that this is going to go up forever? Yeah. So that means that this can only be a local. Why is it a local? Because infinity is a lot bigger than 10. It's going to go up forever. Oh, now, what if x is getting negative? So how about here? If I use negative values for x, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger negatively, which means it's going to go down on that side forever. So that means this can only be a local min. Now, we already discussed we, we expected the graph to look something like this, which it does. That means local max, local min. Okay. Now, there is still a little bit more analysis we're going to do on this graph, and I'll give you a hint. It involves the second derivative, and that you're going to have to wait till Tuesday. That's Tuesday's lecture. But there's a little bit more that we have to know to make, to make it perfect. But for right now, we could draw a very, very accurate graph just using this information. So if I wanted to get some accuracy, let me get rid of this for a moment. <clears throat> so I would make a little table of values, okay? And what, what are two values that are probably really a good idea to include? Oh, I don't know, probably negative one and three. <laughs> now, if I'm going to do negative one and three, then I really need to do zero, one, and two. Now, if I only do this, then I'm going to have a graph basically that looks like this. I kind of need the stuff on this side. And so maybe go one or two units in each, oops, not zero, sorry. Maybe go one or two units in each direction. And, and probably not much more because this is a cubic, which means it's going to, it's going to grow pretty fast. So 
that's probably enough right there. So let me get my calculator out and let's figure out the Y values. So if I put a negative three in there, so I got negative 27 minus 27 plus 27 plus five, that's negative 22. If I put a negative four in there, I'm gonna have a really big negative value. That's probably far enough. All right, so then we got negative eight minus 12 plus 18 plus five, that's three. Negative one, we already know that's 10. Zero, that's easy, five. One is easy, one minus three minus nine plus five, that'd be six. Did I do that right? No, hold on. Minus two minus seven plus five is, oh yeah, that is right, okay. Okay, I didn't mess that up. Now what's two? Okay, so two would be eight minus 12 minus 18 plus five. Eight minus 12 minus 18. This calculator keeps sticking. All right, now we're negative 17. Three, we already know that's negative 22. And how about four? And 64 minus 48 minus 36 plus five. That's negative 15. And then let's do five. Minus 25. Hopefully I didn't make any mistakes in these calculations. And that's back up to 10. Ah, I think we got enough information here to draw a very, very reasonable graph. So let me, now, in the x direction, I'm going from negative three to five. In the y direction, looks like I'm going from negative 22 to positive 10, which happened to also be those values. So negative 22. So probably be about that. Let me get rid of this. So we're going to do this. So maybe um, five. So one, two, three, four. Five, negative one, negative two, negative three. Now I need to go, let's say that's about 10. So then that would be about negative 10 and about negative 20. Okay. This is my computer generated image right here. All right. So let's plot those points. So we have a good view of what the graph probably looks like. So negative three, negative 22, maybe about there. Um, where are we now? Negative two, positive three. Oh boy, we're way up here now. Negative one, positive 10, zero, five, one. Hold on, one. Oh, no, you know what? Not one, six, it's one, negative six. There we go. Yeah, that would have to turn me around otherwise. That, that wouldn't be right. So about there. 2, negative 17, about there. 3, negative 22, about there, same as Alan. 4, negative 15, about there-ish. And then 5, positive 10. All right. We know it turns around here. We know it turns around here. Yeah, pretty good graph. Okay, now do I need to do more points? No, because that's going to go up forever. That's going to go down forever. If I keep doing points, I'm going to have to squish this graph in order to get the remaining points on. And I don't want to squish the graph. I'll lose too much. So that's about as good as it's going to get. So if I was doing this on my graphing calculator, which is always a good idea when you're all done, is to check it. My X window that I would have chosen is exactly what I just did. Negative three to positive five. My Y window, I would have picked negative 22 to positive 10. And whenever you're doing graph and calculator work, you always have the option of going into the window and changing the window. Because you always want to make the window exactly what it is that you're interested in. I could make the window bigger. But again, I would, all I'd be doing is squishing the graph and, and I would lose some information. All right, before we continue, does anybody have a question on this? This is this one here is pretty simple. But everything I did is necessary in order to make a conclusion because there's still more conclusions to be made, as I said, using second derivative 
And also next day, we're going to look at things that involve asymptotes. <laughs> Nothing today involving asymptotes, but next day. Asymptotes are cool. All right, let's try another one. Let's do one similar to one we did last day. How about, let me find it. Let's do h of x is x to the two thirds times x plus five. So I got the fractional exponent here. Now, if you remember last day, we showed if you have a fractional exponent, it's very possible you're going to have a cusp or a vertical tangent somewhere in the in the in the game here. <laughs> this is cube root squared. So are there any restrictions? For first of all, can x be zero? Yes, x can be zero. Can x be negative? Yes, because you can take the cube root of a negative. So my domain is once again all reals. And that's very, very important to recognize because if that had been an even, right, a half or a fourth or a sixth or something like that, then I can't have any negative numbers. If I had a negative exponent, then I can't have any zeros, you know, things like that. That's why you have to be very mindful. Now, I don't want to differentiate it in this form. I can, but then I'd have to use product rule and then I'd have to factor it. So why don't we just multiply it out? And differentiate that, that's going to be way easier. So h prime of x is 5 thirds x to the 2 thirds plus 10 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Okay. Next, I will want to factor that. <clears throat> and I can factor out a 5 thirds and an x to the negative 1 third. And in doing so, these exponents differ by exactly one, so when I factor this out, it should leave a whole x. Quick check, x to the negative one-third times x to the first, yes. Now over here, I factored the whole thing out, plus two. That step that I just did is absolutely critical. I can't finish the problem without doing this, and for a lot of folks, that's the hardest step because the factoring with the fractional exponent can get kind of wonky, but I have to be able to do this. Now, we saw last day that negative exponent is going to be a problem, so I do need to put it downstairs. So this is going to be 5 times x plus 2 over 3 times x to the 1 third, or if you choose, you can write it as cube root. It doesn't make any difference. It makes no difference at all. Now, 0 in the denominator would definitely be a problem. This will equal 0 when x is negative 2. And this is undefined, I'll abbreviate that because I won't have enough room, when x is zero. I have two critical values. x equal negative two is a critical value, and it's the happy one. I have a horizontal tangent there because my derivative equals zero. This is the evil kind, which makes it kind of fun, because the derivative does not exist at zero, but zero is in the domain. So that's the other kind of critical number. So these are my critical numbers. Now we need to make a number line and do what we just did a moment ago. Uh, sorry, this is H. So my H prime number line. Uh, there's two values I need on there. I need negative two and zero. Well, why do I put zero? It's, does, it's not defined as zero. You're right, but it's defined to the right of zero and to the left of zero. And I can change sign when X is zero. Ah, so like we did before, when we have a quotient, if you can change sign, then you definitely have to consider that guy. So if I take numbers to the left of negative two, like negative bazillion, well, five times negative bazillion plus two, that's definitely negative. The cube root of negative bazillion, that's negative. So I'm up here. All right, now let's pick a number between negative two and zero. Okay, how about negative one? Negative one plus two, that's positive. The cube root of negative one, that's negative. Now let's pick a number bigger than zero. Basically, any positive number, I'd be positive over positive. Now, you notice this alternated. A lot of times they alternate, and I've already done an example where they didn't alternate. It is a very dangerous assumption to make to automatically assume your interval is going to alternate. They will alternate. Oh, yes, of all the problems that exist, they will alternate about 50% of the time, which means they won't alternate about 50% of the time. So if you say, oh, let me find this one, and I'll just make it alternate. Um, you're going to be wrong 
often. No, don't do that. Do each interval one at a time. Now, here's what I can say with absolute certainty. My graph's gonna in, increase in these two, decrease in this one, so we will state that. F is increasing, I'm gonna abbreviate so I can fit it in there, in these two intervals. So negative infinity to negative two, and then again, zero to infinity. F is decreasing between negative two and zero. So I'm going up, something happens, I'm coming down, something happens, and I go back up again. That's kind of how I can interpret this. But this is not going to be the same shape as the cubic. No, 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 because there's weird stuff happening here. But now let's identify our extrema. That's the max and the min. So I can say, right now, here's what I can say. This went up, and then it had a horizontal tangent. And then it came down. So I definitely have a maximum there. So I can say that f of negative two, which equals what? Well, if I put negative two here, negative two squared is positive four, and then it's cube root. So cube root of four, negative two plus five is three. So that's three cube root of four. Now, when I graph, I definitely want a decimal value for that, but that is, if I put an x equal negative two, that's what I would get, is blank, Max. Okay. Again, I don't know if it's local or absolute. We'll do that in a moment. Now, zero, something weird happened. It was going down and something wonky happened to zero. I'll just make a hint. That's wonky. And then it came back up again. Don't exactly know what's happening at zero, but I do know it turns around at zero. So f of zero, which is zero, is blank. Now, how do I how do I figure that next part out? Actually, this is kind of simple. Let's go back up to here. Don't, don't look at that. Look at this guy here. X to the two-thirds. That means cube root squared. X to the two-thirds is never negative, is it? Ah, okay. So it's always going to be non-negative. As X grows without bound, it's going to be a positive number, and that's going to grow without bound. So clearly, this is going up forever. Again, as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this is going up forever. So my max has to be local. Now, since this is never negative, what if x is getting negative, huge negative, then this is negative. So it's going to go down forever. So just like before, both of my extrema are local. You know, there's no calculus involved in determining whether it's local or absolute. You just go back to the graph and say, hmm, if I go that way forever, am I going to go up or am I going to go down? It's actually that simple. <laughs> That's not a calculus question. That's just looking at this. I'd have a positive number times a positive number as x gets bigger without bound. I have a positive number times a negative number as x goes negatively without bound. That's it. Okay, last thing, what does it look like? So let's consider I have to erase some of this so I can fit it on there. Well, clearly those guys are important. When x is negative five, this will be zero and I'll have an x-intercept. So I clearly want that in the problem. So here's what I'm gonna do with my table. I'm gonna go as far as negative eight, partly because negative eight will give me a nice number here. So negative seven, negative six, negative five, because that's where it's zero. Negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero. Now, do I need much to the right of zero? Actually, I don't. So I'm going to go maybe one. I don't need much to the right because what's going to happen is as X gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I already know it's going to go up forever. And if I put larger and larger numbers in for X, I might not be able to fit this on. It might get too big too fast. So that's, that's plenty. So let's take the freebies. Oops, let me use my orange pen. So we know... We know that's zero. If I put a one in here, it's one times six. If I put a negative one in here, it's one times four. These are the freebies. How about the negative eight? The cube root of negative eight is negative two. When I square it, that's positive four. If I put a negative eight here, that's negative three times positive four. All right. Everything else I'm going to need a calculator for because none of these are perfect cubes. 
So now I'll just use my calculator and do decimals. So negative seven. So we have, there we go. So that's about negative 7.3 and negative six. That's about negative 3.3. Oh, that was a freebie, sorry. That was zero. I'm putting the four, that's positive 2.5 about. Again, I'm gonna be graphing. I don't need five decimal places. <laughs> One square is only a quarter of an inch typically. All right, so cube root. This is about 4.2 and then finally, So about 4.8, okay? And I think, yeah, I think we're gonna have a fairly accurate graph now. So I'm gonna go from negative eight to one, and I'm gonna go roughly from negative 12 to six. So that means I'm gonna have most of this graph in the third quadrant, it looks like. Oh, like that. So, and I'm only going to go one unit in that direction. He said, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six. What I used to tell the algebra students when I taught algebra is, Typically, when you're numbering these, maybe just number it every five. I don't really even need the negative eight there. But what you don't do is don't don't write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's too cluttered. It's too hard to read. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's more than enough information right there. So now let's draw our perfect perfect graph. So negative eight, negative twelve. So if you have graph paper, it's a little easier because you have squares. Negative seven, negative seven point three. So nine, eight, seven. There and then negative six, negative 3.3 down there, negative five, zero. That was easy. Negative four, about 2.5, negative three, about 4.2, negative two, about 4.8, and negative, whoops. Oh, that's this one right here. And then negative one is about four, because that's going to be my peak, as we see. And then zero is back zero. And then what's happening on the other side of zero? One, I'm up to six. Okay, I think we know exactly what this looks like. What's happening here, anybody? What's the word? Looking for a word. What's happening at the origin? Uh, it's a cusp. It's a cusp. Be careful because you could cut yourself on that. Razor sharp. Now, I know it's a cusp. Here's what it isn't. It isn't, oh, it's going to do that. No, 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 no. It comes down to a sharp point. How do I know that? Well, this is where experience comes in. We just did a graph the other day. Similar. Remember, the derivative did not exist at zero, but it turned around at zero. So I said the only thing is it could be either a vertical tangent or a cusp. Those are the only things it can be for the derivative not to exist there, but the function does exist. So now, what if, what if, what if that had been a negative six? Then that means I would have had a vertical tangent there because it's getting vertical from this side and then it's coming back up. So it's kind of a cool graph. Now, one of the problems of a graphing calculator, graphing calculators have a very difficult time showing cusps. Um, in fact, if you do this on a pretty decent graphing calculator, let me blow up that part right there, right? That's the origin. It'll probably look like this. The graphing calculator will show the cusp, but it won't show it here. But if you zoom in and you blow it up and you blow it up and you blow it up, you'll get the cusp closer to the origin. But for the most part, it won't show it. And it has to do with the pixels. Because it's becoming vertical and it's, you know, the 
uh, you know, it, it does iterations that are really, really, really small quantities. It's hard to explain, but it, it's generally not going to show that. So a graphing calculator is a little deceptive when it comes to things like vertical asymptotes and cusps. Things that are becoming vertical has a very difficult time representing. So there's this one. Let's do one more. I want to do a different type each time. The fact that you have a calculator at your side to calculate values if need be. Now you never, when we answered this question, I said the maximum, right? And we had a, a, a cube root in the answer. Yeah, that's the maximum. The only reason I'd need a decimal is if I wanted to graph it. You, you know, if, if you're working and your, your final answer is square root of two, you'd say it's square root of two. But if I have to do a measurement and or I'm filling a beaker with square root of two milliliters of solution, well, then I need a decimal approximation. But if the answer is irrational, you just state the answer. You don't approximate it unless it's necessary. It was necessary for graphing to approximate. But when I'm giving my answer, if my answer is irrational, just state it. That's not even a big deal. So the last one I want to do, I've got g of x equals how about um, x times the natural log of x. Hmm. This is interesting. So I said, we want to be able to do logs and E's. I'm not interested in doing trig, strangely enough, because the algebra of trying to solve when you have X's and trig functions, it's, it's a little bit nasty. So what is the domain? Anybody want to try this one? What's the domain? Hmm. Well, X obviously, there's no issues here. It might be with the log. Does log have restrictions? Uh, as long as it's not, because if it's zero, there's a problem, right? Yeah, log of zero is a problem, yeah. That doesn't exist. And log of a negative number is imaginary. Mm -hmm. So it can be zero and it can be uh, negative? So, so therefore, all, only all positives. The domain is only positives. Is that important? Yeah, that's really important. I have a pretty big restriction there. I can only use positive input. Okay, so x equals zero is out of, out of the picture. All right, so let's analyze this guy. So g prime of x, that'd be first times the derivative of the second, plus the second times the derivative of the first. Oh, that was easy enough. That's gonna be one plus log x. Now I'd like to set this equal to zero. Well, that would mean log x is negative one, which would mean x is e to the negative one. Oh, because that's log base e, or just simply if you want to write one over e. Oh, so I get a critical number, and my critical number is one over e. One e is close to three, so one over e is close to a third. It's not very big, obviously, but it is definitely in the domain. That's that's important because <laughs> if I'd gotten a negative, that would be That'd be crazy. All right, let's make our number line. So this is our G prime number line. So what should go on my number line? Anybody? Well, obviously, yeah, one over eight. Is that the only thing that should go on my number line? There actually should be one more number on my number line. What number should also be on my number line? We didn't have it on the previous ones. Zero? Zero, how come? You're right, but why? Yeah. Because that's the lowest we can go? Because that's where my restriction was. In the previous examples, when we used all real numbers, there was no reason whatsoever to put a zero on there. That would just be confusing, right? Because zero wasn't part of the decision. But here it is because zero is the, the low end of my, of my domain. So I'm going to put a zero because there can't be anything to the left of zero. That's why. Oh, so I have two intervals, zero to one over e and one over e to infinity. Okay, that's why it's, it is important to put the zero. And again, that's why it's so important to identify the domain because if I don't identify the domain, I may not recognize that I actually have restrictions. So let's go back to that statement right there. If log of one over E is negative one, then this will equal zero at one place. So let's, let's start simple. Let's pick a really big value for X. If X is bazillion, then one plus, see, I can't factor this. One plus log of a bazillion is definitely positive. So when X is positive, or excuse me, when X is large, this is definitely up here. 
Now, remember something about the natural log. The graph of the natural log, not the graph we're drawing right now, but the graph of the natural log we know goes like this. So the natural log, as, as the input of the natural log is closer to zero, this is y equals log x. As the input gets closer to zero, natural log goes towards negative infinity. Yikes. Oh, so if I insert a really, really small positive value for x, then the natural log of that's going to be a really big negative value. That means that 1 plus log x would be negative in this interval here. That's really important. And that comes from understanding what, what a natural log actually looks like in general. So based on this, I can clearly say that g is increasing in the interval 1 over e to infinity, which is pretty much most of the graph. But g is decreasing from 0 to 1 over e. And that's not very much. But the fact is, I was decreasing. I have a horizontal tangent. And now I'm increasing. I do know that. So I can say with certainty that g of 1 over e. Now, what is g of 1 over e? Well, let's see. The natural log of 1 over e, we already know, is negative 1 times 1 over e. Hmm, that's interesting. I don't want a decimal. I, negative 1 over e is the value. Now, this is blank minimum. Now, it's the only critical value I have. So I'm not going to have a max, I'm, but I'm clearly going to have a minimum here. Now, go back to the graph. As x grows without bound, clearly this is going up. The question is, what's happening as x approaches 0? Well, this says I was from wherever I'm descending, I'm flat, and then I'm back up again. This has to be the absolute minimum. I only turn around once, OK? Kind of like a parabola. So I'm going to do something like that. Now, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I have a pretty good idea. So if, with that being said, let me erase some of this. I don't really need to graph much. I got that one. By the way, when x is 1, log of 1 is 0. So when x is 1, I get a 0. Maybe I'll put out just a few values. Um, I'll just, let's just do 2, 3, 4. Let's just go that far, because we have a pretty good idea what's going to happen. So 2 log 2 is about, about 1.4. 3 log 3 is about 3.3. .3. And 4 log 4 is about 5.5. .5. All right, that's enough. Now, there's, there's nothing to the left of the y-axis, so there's not much reason to put stuff to the left of the y-axis. So we make these big units. One, two, three, four. And in this direction, one, two, three, four, five. And, and here's where it's a little bit tricky. We said 1 over e is close to a third. So this is roughly you know, close to a third, eh, right about there. And then 1, 0, 2, 1.4, about here, about here. Definitely know it's going to do that. The question is, what's happening over here? Hmm. Hmm. Does it go up? Does it go down? Does it go straight? Well, we know it goes up because we know it was decreasing. So it goes this way. <laughs> and here's the tricky part. That, that's supposed to be flat. Sorry, I didn't do a very good job there. Make that look prettier. Well, the question is, what would hap what's happening this way? We don't exactly know, and by the way, this is a problem that I just did last week in Calc 2. We did this problem. 
In Calc 2, you will learn a technique that will allow you to take this limit. Okay, so I'm going to tell you, if I take the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of x log x, well, obviously, x is approaching 0, but the log x is approaching negative infinity. That's a problem. That's an indeterminate form that we've never seen. But in, in Calc 2, you will learn how to attack this type of indeterminate form. And it turns out we show that this limit is, in fact, 0. Why is that important? Because that means that there is a removable discontinuity at the origin, which is really cool. So it looks like this. Now, we just don't know this yet. We know every other part of this graph at this point. So that's kind of neat. So the idea is if I give you a function, you can always, always tell me where the derivative is 0, where are my intervals of increasing and decreasing, and where are my extrema using the first derivative test. This is something you can now do always for every problem that you're going to run across. Okay. There is more analysis next day that we're going to talk about. And I said second derivative stuff. So there's a little bit more. In other words, as this is going up, is it going this way? Is it maybe is it tailing off that way? You know, what is the shape of the curve? Those are some of the things. It has to do with shape. All right. So we're done with this part. Now we're going to do a kind of a theoretical thing. We're going to go over a very important theorem that unfortunately we don't have a lot of use for now but it becomes huge later on. It, we're gonna do a theorem that we don't have any application for today, but I've already used to prove one of the most important theorems and techniques you're gonna learn in Calc 2. We used this that I'm about to show you to prove that thing, okay? So what we're gonna do is something called the mean value theorem. for derivatives, because there's a second mean value theorem you're going to learn later, the, the evil version, the one for antiderivatives. It's totally different. So the mean value theorem for derivatives. So let me first set it up. Okay. Now, if you've ever, uh, anybody here who's ever done any form of drafting, you know, you've, you've got a big table in front of you, maybe you have big blueprints, um, you're, you're drawing a house, I don't care, whatever. You want your walls to look parallel. You want the floors to look parallel. But when you're trying to do this, you know, in your ruler and you're moving your ruler around and trying to make things parallel, it's very difficult. So if you've ever worked at a drafting table, you have a ruler that's literally on wheels that you can roll up and down the page to maintain your parallel lines. I, I call it a rolling ruler. And this theorem is kind of the rolling ruler theorem. So here's how the theorem works. If I took any function, doesn't matter what the function is. And I said, let's start here and, you know, let's end up here. Okay. If I have a function and all I have to be is differentiable, that means I cannot have cusps, corners, discontinuities. I just, nice smooth curve, like a, like a polynomial. All right. We know that any line connecting two points, that line is called a secant line. Okay. That's a secant line. That's always been that way. You know, and when I find the slope of a secant line, that's baby algebra, right? Change in y over change in x. That's a, that's a piece of cake. If I have a function that's differentiable, and I'm going from point A to point B, think of the rolling ruler. That means if I put my ruler along this tangent line and I move, or excuse me, along the secant line and I move it up and down, there's going to be at least, look at my picture. There's got to be at least one tangent line that's parallel to that. So just Visually, I'm thinking right about maybe here, and then maybe right about here. So in my picture, it looks like there's two places where I have a tangent line that is parallel to my secant line, okay? This is what the mean value theorem guarantees. It basically guarantees that if you have a nice happy curve, let's leave it like that, I have a happy curve, nothing weird, no cusps, no corners, no discontinuities, no nothing, nothing crazy. It's differentiable everywhere in the interval, and I have the endpoints. Then there's at least one tangent line that is parallel to the secant line. That's why I call it the rolling ruler theorem, because if I take my rolling ruler, I can clearly find at least one. Now, the theorem guarantees there's at least one. I found two. More often than not, there's only going to be one. Okay. So if I took something as simple as, let's say, a parabola. 
Now pick any two points on your parabola. Let's say I want to go here and here. Okay, those are my two points. So now if I drew the line passing through those two points, now I'm use my rolling ruler. It looks like maybe right around here, okay? There, there's going to be a place on my parabola, but in this case, probably just one place that I'm going to have a parallel tangent line. So now we're going to state the theorem because the, the formal statement of the theorem can look scary. So if f of x is differentiable, over the, remember we said, you always describe differentiability over an open interval. I'm differentiable over an open interval and the end points have to exist. I can't go from open to open. I can't go from hole to hole. The end points have to exist. And the way we said that was the limit as X approaches A from the right of F of X equals F of A. Here's what I'm saying. I have a function that's differentiable from A to B. Now, the limit as I approach A from the right is the functional value. I just filled in the endpoint. The limit as X approaches B from the left of F of X is F of B. Now I just filled in that one. That's actually a pretty simple notion because, again, continuity and differentiability are only defined over open intervals, and I need the endpoints to exist. That also means that my function itself could be over a closed interval. The problem is you can't be differentiable over a closed interval if the domain is a closed interval. You can only be differentiable over the open interval. And now I need the endpoints to exist. So now that I threw that in there, okay. That's a simple criteria, by the way. This is called the hypothesis. Now I'm going to state the conclusion. Remember how it works. If a hypothesis is met, then the conclusion is guaranteed. If the hypothesis isn't met, there's no guarantee of anything, okay? So now with this said, there is a C, a value C in the open interval A to B. What that means is that C is between A and B. There's a C, an element of the open interval. That's the same statement. Such that F prime of C that's the tangent line, right? F prime of C, that is very specifically the slope of the tangent line, okay? Will equal, now what is the slope of the secant line? Well, it'd be change of Y over change of X. This goes back to baby algebra. That's the definition of slope. That's delta Y over delta X. That's rise over run. Mean value theorem says, again, I have a happy function that has endpoints. There's at least one place where the slope of the tangent line will equal the slope of the secant line. That's it. Okay. That's, it's not really a complicated thing to do. So I got this. Now, here's a really simple way of thinking of this. Let me give you a really simple application. All right. You're going to drive up to LA today. You know, let's say it's about 120 miles and let's say it takes you two hours. Okay. Real simple. So what was your average speed? Went 120 miles in two hours. So what's your average speed? Anybody? 120 miles, two hours. Actually, take the Actually, derivative. 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour, okay. Yeah. Now, you left from your house, you arrived in LA exactly two hours later, your average was exactly 60 miles an hour. Does that mean you drove 60 miles an hour the entire two hours? Hmm. Does it mean you were constantly at 60 miles an hour or might you have been going faster sometimes and slower at other times? Because remember, you started from the stop. So you had to get up to 60. Maybe you're going faster. Maybe you hit some traffic. It's LA. Of course you hit some traffic. <laughs> so that's a question. That's actually mean value theorem. Let me show you a picture. Okay. So. This is time. This will be distance. We, we, for some reason, we always use S for distance. I don't know why. We always do it in all math classes. All right. You left from your house. You left right here. And you went faster and 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 then you stopped. Okay. 
So here, if you want to say that's, there's your two hours. And if you want to say there's your 120 miles. All right. Does, does everybody understand you started from a dead stop? You went faster and faster and faster, and then you actually slowed down and you came to a dead stop again. When I do this, that slope, the slope of this, is my 120 miles divided by two hours. So the slope of this is exactly like Nate said, 60 miles per hour. Now, ds dt or s prime of t, if s represents distance, and this is time, then the derivative is distance per time. That, that's what speed is. Speed is distance per time. Oh, but the difference is the slope of the tangent line of my black curve, the slope of the tangent line at every point would be your speed at that moment in time. That's exactly what it means. So if I said at the, you know, at this time, how fast was I going would be the slope of that tangent line. At this time, how fast was I going would be the slope of that tangent line. The orange represents the average over the two hours, not the instantaneous. Instantaneous is how fast are you going right at that time. So places where the tangent line is steeper than the orange, then obviously I'm driving faster than 60 miles an hour. Places where the tangent line right, isn't as steep are places where I was going slower than 60 miles an hour. So here's the question. If you drove to LA, took you exactly two hours and you went 120 miles, did you have to drive 60 the whole time? Well, of course not. That's, that's no brainer because you had to start from a dead stop and you had to finish at a dead stop. Then is it reasonable that there was at least one time you were going 60? You see, if you're starting from scratch and you got up to 100 at some point, didn't you have to pass through 60 miles an hour? And when you slowed down, didn't you have to pass back through 60? Well, you said, well, I, I never was going as fast as 60 miles an hour. I, I was always slower. Well, then you wouldn't have made it in two hours, would you? <laughs> if you went 120 in two hours, you couldn't have done that if you were driving less than 60 the whole time. It would have taken you a lot longer. So when I'm looking at my picture, clearly there's a couple of places, maybe right there and right about there. There's a couple of places where I clearly was going exactly 60. So I'm moving up, my speedometer hit 60, and then I was going a little faster. I was going faster for a while, and then I started slowing down. I hit 60 again, and then I slowed down. The mean value theorem guarantees you must have been going 60 at least once. But because I came back to the stop, in this case, probably twice. Now, is it possible when I'm in constant traffic that this curve could have been bouncing all over the place? Maybe I passed through 60 many times. But the mean value theorem just says you had to do it at least once. So let's do a simple example with a function. Strangely enough, it's, it's not the application that I'm doing now that we need. It's actually just the theoretical part of this that we need later on. So suppose that let's let f of x equal, we'll keep it really simple. f of x is, um, let's just say it's, it's x squared, okay? And let's say my interval is uh, about negative one to, to two. My graph is y like squared, my interval is negative one to two. So first the thing is determine, oops, determine if the hypothesis of the mean value theorem is satisfied. That's usually always the first thing we want to do. Then if it is, find C, an element of the open interval. So in other words, the C I'm finding is not the endpoint. It's not negative one, it's not two. It's a value between so that F prime of C is equal to F of two minus F of negative one over two minus negative one. That's the slope of the secant line. That's the slope of the tangent line. Okay, so let's do that. So I have to take one derivative in the entire problem. That's it, because I have to be able to do this. So f prime of x is 2x. So f prime of c is 2c. Okay, that was easy enough. Now, what's f of 2 minus f of negative 1, 2 minus 1? Well, f of 2, let's write it right here. That's 4. 
f of negative 1 is just 1. 2 minus negative 1, that's 3. OK. The slope of the secant is exactly 1. f prime of c is 2c. The slope of the secant is 1. I just need this right here. Well, clearly, that would mean my c is a half. Is a half in this interval? Yes, it is. OK? So I'm done. I've, I've answered the question. What did we just do? Let's draw a picture. And I'll reiterate, you never have to draw the picture to answer the question, but sometimes it's beneficial. So we said from negative 1 to 2. So that would be the point negative 1 comma 1. And up here, let's say there, that's the point 2 comma 4. So the line passing through these is going to have slope 1. Now, if I go here to about 1 half, yeah, my, my, my thing's not perfectly to scale. The slope of the tangent line at the point 1 half comma 1 fourth, if you will, is going to equal, the slope of this tangent line is going to equal the slope of the secant line. That's what we just said. Okay, fairly simple algebra. There's really nothing about this that's complicated. Okay, so this is the mean value theorem. Let's do another example. Now, the idea when I say doesn't satisfy the hypothesis, what's the hypothesis? I didn't, I, I kind of skipped that part. The hypothesis is that you are differentiable over the open interval. Is y equal x squared differentiable over the open interval? Yes, because it's a polynomial. It is differentiable everywhere. So if I had a square root function, a square root function is differentiable everywhere except the endpoint, you know, where it's defined. Most functions are differentiable over their whole domain. But if I have an endpoint, it's not differentiable there. If I have a cusp, it's not differentiable there. But most functions are differentiable almost everywhere they are defined. So if you have a function that's got a weird thing, a discontinuity, something, it's probably not differentiable there. So let's do the problem again. Let's say that uh, g of x, keep it simple, is 1 over x, and I want to do the mean value theorem, um, and we'll use the, we'll keep it simple, negative 2 to 2, okay? So same, same, exact same question. So let's find that g prime of x, first of all, that will be negative 1 over x squared, so g prime of c is negative 1 over c squared, okay? Now, I need the, I need g of 2 minus g of negative 2 over 2 minus negative 2, because that's, that's the slope of the secant, that's the slope of the tangent. So what will this quantity be? It's going to be 1 half minus g of negative 2 is negative 1 half over 2 minus negative 2. Okay, so stare at that for a moment. And what's that? So it's a half plus a half. That's 1. That's just 1 fourth. Okay, great. So all I need to do is do negative 1 over c squared and set that equal to negative, or excuse me, set that equal to 1 fourth. Well, the easiest way to do this is take the reciprocal of both sides. So c squared is negative 4. And, um, uh, uh-oh, there, there's something not quite right here. Is there a problem with that statement? We, we haven't made any error. We're going into imaginary numbers territory? Yeah. We've got imaginary numbers as our only possible answer. Why is that? Can anybody tell me why? In other words, this isn't going to work. Hmm. Well, let's see. The hypothesis is that I am differentiable over the open interval. So am I differentiable over the open interval from negative 2 to 2? That's a closed interval? Right. Well, no, you, 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 can't, oh, you can't be. There's no such thing as mathematics over a closed interval. It's always over the open. Am I differentiable over the open interval from negative 2 to 2? Am I differentiable over the open interval? No. That's I'm really not even funny. defined. It's not even defined over the whole interval. Why? Because it's not defined at 0. Ah, zero smack dab in the middle of that interval, isn't it? 
So this failed the hypothesis. So what I should have done right off the bat is G is not, I'm going to abbreviate, differable <laughs> at x equals zero. So it fails the hypothesis. Now, I, I pulled a fast one on you because there's nothing about the problem that seems to be you know, a problem. Well, clearly that there is an issue here. So now let me draw a picture of what we just did to show you why it failed. So let's consider the graph of y equal 1 over x. Okay, I used two, I used that point right there, which was two comma a half. And I used that point right there, which was negative two comma negative one half. And then we drew the line passing with your best I can right here. Okay, and that is the secant line, and that line has slope one fourth, no problem. But now when I do my rolling ruler, you see the problem? <laughs> this is a slope that's positive. This graph is always going downhill. All of its tangent lines have negative slopes. This graph's going downhill. All of its tangent lines have negative slopes. So my rolling ruler, there's never going to be a place where I have a tangent line that's parallel to this. Hopefully you can all see that. So why did this fail? because it's not defined at zero, which means it's definitely not differentiable over that interval. Ah, uh, so if I have a function where weird stuff can possibly happen, discontinuities, that's an issue. So does that mean that you can never use the mean value theorem on this function? No, it just means you can't use the mean value theorem if zero is in the interval. Oh, what if I had made this interval one to two? Would that have worked? Yeah. Yeah. That would have been no problem. In fact, I probably would have, it would have been easy. As long as my interval, I'm differentiable over the interval, which means the interval can't include the weird stuff. Okay. The weird stuff is always the funnest, coolest stuff, but it also causes some, you know, problems with the calculus. <laughs> so this didn't work if my interval included zero, but any interval that I would have picked that didn't include zero would have been fine. So when you are asked and you're gonna be asked, does it satisfy the hypothesis of the mean value theorem? Look at your function and say, hmm, is the interval that I'm asked to work with a problem? If it's not, then you say, no, it's differentiable over the interval. Otherwise you say, no, it's not differentiable at zero. So it fails. And you have to understand that, that it can fail. Now. If I'm differentiable over the open interval, then absolutely this is going to work. So then if it didn't work, it might mean just have an arithmetic error. That's totally a different animal. All right. So let me stop.